Last week we did the video on driving to the highest vacuum, it was that fuel economy one, and there were a lot of comments and a lot of questions just having to do with tuning through vacuum in general. So I figured let's just do, let's do a, a video that goes around all of the different things that you can tune with vacuum and one that you never should, right? So let's start with the ones that you can tune um, and what it's intended for. Wait, before we even do that, let's define terms. A lot of you guys ask, do you take these readings from ported or from manifold vacuum? And when you're tuning with a vacuum gauge, you're always taking from manifold vacuum, not ported. The difference between manifold vacuum and ported is, manifold vacuum is what the, what the intake manifold sees before it gets to the throttle blades of the carburetor. Ported vacuum is what you see when you open the throttle. So, any tuning things that you're gonna do, as, as far as the vacuum gauge goes, it's always from manifold vacuum. And a lot of you guys keep seeing this question over and over again. Vacuum advance, do you do it with ported vacuum or manifold vacuum? And it's a very simple answer. When it's a direct connection between the distributor's vacuum advance and the carburetor, always ported. Never, never manifold, always ported. Now, on some 1970s uh, emission-controlled cars, the vacuum advance circuit did take its, 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 its main uh, signal from the manifold, but there were all sorts of other things involved in that system. It, it, and some of it got really crazy. I mean, you really want to see the insanity of 1970s vacuum routing. Look at like the, the vacuum routing diagram from like a 1977 T-Bird, and, and like you'll just, right? On some of those applications, they did take it from the manifold, but like I said, it was the, the main signal was, for, was from the manifold, but the control of it was through ported. So, simple answer on that: vacuum advance always ported, as long as it's as, as long as it's it's a, it's a direct connection directly between the distributor and the carburetor. It's always ported. Okay, so now. What things can you tune? How do you tune with the vacuum gauge? So we've got this thing set up here now on, on our Edelbrock. This engine, by the way, this is a oh, this is a 440, um, very mild engine. Uncle Kathy built this a couple of years ago. Runs like a top. It has a small cam, so it pulls less vacuum than the 360 that's in our Swinger. Um, but this is probably more representative of what the average the average setup you're going to find. You know, it's a relatively stock engine. Uh, it's got a small cam. It's got the carburetor. It's got headers. Uh, the one in the swinger pulls around 20 inches of mercury at idle. This one pulls about 16 inches of mercury at idle. So um, the first first thing you do you can do with this. You can use a tachometer to accomplish pretty much the same thing. But tune with a vacuum gauge is to set your idle mixture screws. So the first thing you want to do, before you do anything else, is take the screws and turn them all the way in. Bury them out in. Okay, like so. Now you're going to, you want to turn them out two turns, two full turns. One, two. One, two. Is that right? That's close enough for government work. All right. So with that, let's start this thing. Let me plug this in. All right, so you can see now, we're pulling right about 16 and a half inches. And all you're gonna do now, Slowly turn the screws, each of the screws, so you see a reaction. Alright, so right there. Okay, we we're looking for our highest vacuum, our highest, smoothest vacuum. Make sure you drop it down there. Right about there. It's that simple. 
we all we did was adjust those screws until we had the highest smoothest vacuum rating a lot of times uh, what I'll do is after I've achieved that I'll go like another quarter turn to the fat side on each just so that the engine warms up a little smoother um, but there's average that's that's about how you do that now we talked about especially on, on the on the mileage video we talked about the uh, the fuel enrichment circuits now on a Carter Edelbrock style it's handled through these metering rods and these springs and these springs fight vacuum now a lot of times what you'll find is when you put it when you put one of these other box together or you put a car together with one of these carburetors take these take these shields off like I've got here and start the motor and you see as soon as we started it she buried herself but she's staying down there now See where it pops up and up on the throttle? That's about right. A lot of times you'll have a cam that's so big in one of these things, so little vacuum here that you'll start the engine and you'll see this thing bouncing up and down like this. At that point you want to put a lighter spring. You want to take this spring out. Uh, uh, that one right there and you want to replace it with a lighter spring and you want to keep going lighter until with the engine idling and at your highest vacuum reading, manifold vacuum reading, you want this thing buried solid and you don't want it to budge, you don't want it to move until you crack the throttle then it should pop right back up again. Now you can also tune this thing with the car in gear. That's actually your best way to do this. Just have somebody sit in the car with the, with the car in gear, foot on a brake and then you can you can get a more accurate tune on this and you can also figure out exactly where the opening point is going to be and again it's a balancing act it's something that you just say it's trial and error but that's the difference between a car that just goes through the motions or one that really delivers you know it's snappy it, it, it gets good economy it runs right these are the small detail differences that that make the difference now when you're talking about a holly carburetor you've got a power valve so this is this is the fuel metering on, or the, the, the fuel enrichment circuit on a car or Edelbrock and in this is the fuel enrichment circuit on a Holley. So the power valve, the way you, these things are marked if, if you, I don't have glasses on so I can't show you where the mark is on this but they're marked for the inches of mercury that they open up so a 6.5 will open it at 6.5 inches of mercury, 6.5 inches of mercury. With a vacuum gauge to a ported or, or to, a, to, a, to a manifold vacuum source, not ported, manifold vacuum source, you want to have the vacuum reading. So on this engine, we're, we're, we've got 16 inches of mercury at idle. And you want to do this in gear. If it's, if it's, if it's, a, if it's a, a, an automatic, manual doesn't make any difference. But if it's an automatic, you want to do this again with somebody sitting in the car, have it in gear, idling, full temperature, and whatever the vacuum reading is you want half of that here so 16 inches of mercury on here we want a 7.5 um, there it's not going to be precise it's just in the ballpark but essentially the closest you can come to having the vacuum reading is the reading that you want on the power valve all right and also on a holly this port right here is your ported vacuum and you'll, you'll find the manifold vacuum at the base. Setting the ignition timing to your highest vacuum is, it, when I say it's an old school trick, I mean it goes back to like the Model A. Um, it goes back to be, just beyond the days when, when, when they had mechanical advance built into the, you know, into the steering column on the steering wheel, they had the lever to advance and retard the timing. It goes back that far. It's not something you ever, ever want to do on a performance engine. It's not something you ever want to do on, an, on, on, a, on a modern engine. Now, in the old days, I remember when I was a kid, when I was like, you know, 16, 17, and just learning to do this stuff, um, we did set a lot of like the low performance, older luxury cars set at highest vacuum because when you've got the initial timing set at that highest vacuum, it's the smoothest 
um, um, snappiest throttle response you're going to find. But those things never saw full throttle. They were never under any sort of load. So if you were working in a shop and you want to make the customer really happy that when they step on the gas, the car went like that, you would set it to the highest vacuum. But there are far, when you're talking about a performance engine, there are far too many factors that determine what the optimum timing is. You know, total timing built in, into the mechanical advance, the, the, the curve, how quickly it comes in, you know, what the engine will tolerate as far as compression ratio, as far as temperature goes, as far as load goes. There are so many different variables that there is never any reason to try to set your ignition timing off of a vacuum gauge. Unless it's a Model A or a, a 1963 Caddy and you want this thing to just go whoop, as soon as you touch the gas. Performance wise, no. Stay away, don't do it, use a light. So I think I, I think I covered pretty much everything I wanted to talk about with this. Um, yeah, if you guys have any other questions, throw them in the comments and if there's enough of them, we'll do another video on this. So good basic stuff, you know? It's what separates the men from the boys. See you tomorrow.